to open the presentation. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, today we are going to talk about infrastructure as code and in particularly for uh, one technology stack called Pulmium. Um, just a little bit of background. I noticed this uh, technology stack a few years back. Uh, I don't know if you know the site Hacker News. It regularly has like very nice uh, posts about different technologies, some blog posts, etc. So essentially, I got this from there, and it seemed like a very nice and neat idea. And of course, it's it was a little bit uh, in the early stages at that point. I, I'm not sure it entirely if it's in the early stages, but it didn't have much adoption, let's say, uh, at that time. But it developed quite nicely since then and it has some kind of uh, very unique features and very uh, very good approach to some things that I like and uh, so it's going to probably be more adoptable in the future as well. Um, you can try it for free. Uh, it has a very very nice uh, free offering uh, and I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later about the uh, how how it's presented is is uh, in terms of monetary uh, gain for for Pulumi, etc. So uh, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about uh, infrastructure as code and and the idea that it's something that can be automated and programmatically uh, designed as code uh, as infrastructure. Um, this is one of the things that uh, is very uh, very useful and we have to. Um, use as much as possible automations for, for uh, reusability and for uh, our way of introducing uh, infrastructure to uh, different uh, teams and to different uh, to, to our clients, etc. So one of those uh, stacks called Pumi is using the approach uh, that is uh, essentially uh, programmatic approach in the actual sense of, of the words for uh, programmatic and it's called, and it's actually uh, using uh, uh, very well-known languages to, to achieve this purpose. So what exactly is Pulumi? Pulumi is uh, uh, the developer project, developer mindset of uh, uh, infrastructure as code. So essentially it's going to use uh, actual programming languages and it's going to be uh, for for writing your own code and not just uh, declarative uh, statements. So essentially you can do almost anything and you're not impeded by any uh, restrictions. You, you can even extend it to, to your own ends. So uh, this is for people who want to write infrared actual code and uh, they have a favorite language with favorite tools and they can use that as, as long as it's supported by Plumi because of course you need to be adopted in uh, the Plumi uh, ecosystem. So, and this is uh, also uh, some kind of a, a, a gap that is being uh, bridged by uh, developers and DevOps and SysOps and other kinds of personnel that are uh, trying to uh, maintain the infrastructure. So it's not only for DevOps people, it could be also for developers as well. It's very useful to, to learn uh, as a developer. And I would say that it's it's a nice idea to have a collaboration between developers and DevOps with this kind of uh, stack because it's going to create a lot of opportunities to create something better and you have understanding between each other, which is going to be nice. So. Um, this is, uh, like I said, more for, uh, it's not only for DevOps, it's also for uh, developers as well. Uh, the way it's designed, it's designed through SDK. Uh, so this is Software Development Kit. And essentially it's going to be uh, something that sits on top of your programming language. It's not going to be something like an entire technology that you need to download and it's going to be something uh, separate. You, you have to uh, learn an entire new language or entire new syntax of, uh, of this new language, etc. So the learning curve is very small in terms of what you need to know, uh, new things that you need to know. And of course there is lots of documentation. I'm going to say it's not perfect documentation, but still it's better than most. And it's, it has lots of uh, uh, adoption from the community. So you get lots of answers from there, but generally you might miss some, uh, some very minute details in the documentation. So you would have to 
either dig through the code itself or maybe go through community uh, pages. So uh, it is implemented uh, on top of one of the most widely adopted languages and ecosystems. So it's going to have a lot of prospect to, to be usable for you. Um, I forgot to mention uh, in, the, in the agenda that today I'm going to do a demo on, on Python. Uh, of course, uh, I could probably do it on some of the other languages, but I'm not so versed in them. And it's not so much uh, a difficult task to do it in a sim such a simple project, but still I'm going to do it in something that I had more, more experience in. And this is something that uh, is part of my background. I usually, um, I've, I have a background as a developer as well. And I usually uh, to, like to, to, uh, uh, to tinker with Python and with uh, some other uh, technology stacks, but Python is one of, uh, one of my favorites as well. So uh, this is how it's implemented. And there is also uh, the, uh, the, the, the side of the uh, Puumi uh, stack that you need to know that's, uh, that's managing the, the resources. So this is the, uh, uh, essentially what you need to, uh, to use to, to continuously manage your resources. There is a, a service called Puumi service, which is essentially what is paid by, uh, what is paid for Pulumi. So essentially this is their monitoring model. They, they have the SDK is free and all of the codes and all of the plugins, et cetera, and, and the, uh, the different deliverables, but the Puumi service is paid. So they, they have a subscription model for this Puumi service. It's attached to the, uh, to the SDK and to, to all of the code that it's produced by Plumi, but the service is paid and, and it's based on token-based uh, um, payment model. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, it provides a lot of goodies, which are essentially not um, not in the, the in the free uh, in the free let's say model and, and they're not there but you can also make them yourself so so you can always do that even if you don't use their uh, service but you're you're going to have to implement some stuff uh, yourself so it's going to take a little bit more effort or maybe more than a little bit more so uh, this is something that is part of the Puomi ecosystem, but it's uh, paid. So this is, this is their, uh, their monetary uh, model. So how, it, how widely is adopted uh, Puomi? Puomi uses uh, vanilla uh, language runtime environments and it uses their vanilla languages. So it doesn't really um, have any specific uh, needs on top of what actually the, the SDK. The SDK is just there and it's going to work. So uh, the uh, type of, uh, or oh, sorry, the, the the list of available languages as of today are TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, Go, and .NET. In .NET, we hear, we're talking about C Sharp. And essentially, uh, if any language is added at later point, they are all going to be uh, developed at the same pace. So everything that's released for one language is actually developed for all of them. So it, you don't have like differences in, in uh, functionality between them. So you always get the same functionality for all the languages. I remember that there was some kind of a push to get Java into the list, but still nothing there. Of course, if you know Java, it's easy to switch to some of the others. It's not so big deal, but of course, if you don't uh, want to learn a new language, then you might try to uh, use some, some other tool, but it's not a very small list. So you get uh, you get your pick from, from the list of languages. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions during the presentation, just let me know. I'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. And we, if, we, if it's a more, uh, a topic that's requiring more time. I'm going to leave it for the end. So if we have time, we're going to discuss this at the end because we have uh, some stuff to uh, do and we don't have much time. So these are the languages that are supported. So on top of each of those languages, you get the uh, SDK that's being uh, produced by Pumi. So uh, what is also uh, available by Pumi? So what 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 can you do uh, as infrastructure? They have uh, the thing they have a thing that they call core providers, but this is not their only supported providers. So these are the uh, top three uh, 
cloud services, the AWS, Azure, and GCP, and also Kubernetes as an infrastructure. So these are more like their um, biggest libraries or uh, biggest uh, providers that they, they have the most resources about in, in one package. But this doesn't mean that they have only those uh, under their support. They also have a bunch of others, including they have a specific providers within AWS service, for example, like AKS. Uh, sorry, EKS, uh, because sometimes they need more fine tuning within uh, within this specific specific provider. So they create a specific provider for this, and you can use it. And you can use them in uh, in conjunction, so we don't need to uh, uh, actually choose about them. Uh, there is some uh, actually uh, duality in in those core providers. They have uh, two different packages: uh, one package called native, and one package called classic. Uh, it's, it's the way they are built. Those providers have uh, different uh, origins or different methods that they were built. So the classic is usually built by SDK. So it's going to be built by AWS SDK. While the AWS, AWS native provider is going to use the API from AWS. So there is a difference in, in what they present in, as functionality, but not that much. So essentially the native usually gets the same day uh, evolutions and functionalities while the SDK one, the, the, the classic one usually has to wait for some time to be implemented or something like that. So uh, these are the core providers. Like I said, there are many more, more supported and created by Pulumi. Also, there is uh, other providers uh, created by the community. So they are not officially supported by Pulumi, but they have wide adoption and usually they might have support from their creators. So it, it depends on what kind, what kind of uh, provider is it. And if, if it's maybe the provider wants, to, uh, the creator wants to uh, monetize this uh, provider. So they might charge for support or something like that. Um, Generally, most of them are open source. I, I haven't actually seen many that are uh, that require for for money for support or something like that. There is also the option to bridge external providers. There are some uh, types of transcoders. Let's say transcoders, not exactly transcoders, but something like transcoders for external providers, like providers from Terraform or from uh, CloudFormation or something like that. I haven't worked with those. They say it's pretty easy to set up. Uh, I'll send you at, at the end of the presentation a link to, for example, one of them, and you can see how they are set up. Uh, this is the idea that you, for example, uh, you're a fan of, let's say, Terraform uh, community and you love their provider. So if you want, you can use them. Uh, there are some restrictions with these uh, bridges, but you have to see them in, in their, in their uh, description pages. And of course, finally, you can write your own. You can even contribute to the Plumi uh, community. So if you want, you can write your own uh, providers and you can implement for anything you, you want, even if it's uh, something that's very niche, like for example, some service in your local, uh, in your country or something like that. So you can always grow the, the environment. So uh, what can you do with uh, Plumi and, and how you can do it? Um, of course, the first thing that you're going to do is going to write code. So uh, the idea is to codify your solutions using imperative programming languages like Go, like uh, C Sharp and uh, Python. And you need to have in mind that you're going to uh, switch to, the, to a different paradigm sometimes and it's going to be it's going to differ a little bit from most other solutions which are declarative. So this is something that's for, um, let's say purposes that the other ones cannot uh, accomplish and or the other solutions cannot accomplish or sometimes you want to use something that you already know like uh, this language and you, you're used to this kind of uh, descriptive uh, programming or something that's, that's uh, on, on your path. So uh, what can you actually accomplish with those? You can use the strong points of any language that you choose from the supported one. So you know that you are versed in this language. You know that you uh, can use very uh, cool features from this language or that the language is uh, very neat to, to write and to read the code. And it's going to be uh, very easy for your team to, to manage this uh, code base for, for for whatever reasons you decide that you're going to use this language, then 
that's that's up to you. You're going to play to the strengths of this language. What uh, stands out is that you can actually write code uh, within uh, within the same pipeline as the actual code. For example, for the applications that are going to be, let's say, if you're working on a software software development project and you're going to and procure infrastructure for this software development project you can actually combine those into one project and, and they can be they can run uh, within ci cd processes within one line uh, within the same pipelines with same with the same policies and uh, the same testing etc so everything can be unified and you can be, you can uh, build code with the developers or even some developers could do that uh, infrastructure as code as well. So it doesn't really matter, but you're going to get some um, consistency and it's going to be easy to to, uh, to manage, etc. So this is something that's uh, a strong point if you're uh, if you expect some kind of uh, uh, unification and uh, homogeneous environment for for your project. And this is something that's uh, going to uh, be used to manage your resources throughout the lifetime of the, the project. So um, you can either uh, use the Pumi service that I mentioned before, or you can uh, manage uh, your own. Uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, in a little bit more uh, in the next few slides. So essentially, uh, you can choose what type of uh, management service you want to uh, use for, for, this, uh, for the Pumi stack to manage the resources. But in either case, you can uh, manage your uh, services, uh, sorry, and manage your infrastructure uh, throughout the lifetime of the project. It's not something that's going to be just deployed and then left off, et cetera. So uh, the, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. So how, how does the structure of the, the Pumi, uh Pumi stack, the Pumi framework is uh, organized. And this is something that we're going to uh, talk in terms of logical entities. Um, this is the, uh, the breakdown of, of, the, of the most common logical entities. And uh, essentially what's, what you're going to uh, check in, in the Pumi documentation is um, information and, and uh, you're going to read for, for them. So this is these are the most important ones. So, a project is a single logical group of the same uh, infrastructure that's going to be built. And this is uh, essentially detached from configuration and instances. So a project is just the, the logical organization of, of your Pumi program. And each project can be um, different in size, different in, in, in dependencies, etc. So uh, there are a few approaches that you can get, uh, that you can in, employ. So for example, uh, one approach is to have one project for your entire uh, software development project, let's say. And that's a valid approach, of course, you can do that, but sometimes you, you might want to break it down to smaller pieces. And let's say if it's a, a microservice architecture that you're building, you can create a project for each microservice so that they would be maintainable easily and they, they, they would be uh, easily deployable, etc. But this depends on how you're what your vision for for the project is, etc. So there is a, a, a pro, um, there is a propensity to to do whatever you need to do in terms of logical organization. But essentially, this is the the, the logical organization of your infrastructure. You can, of course, uh, create dependencies between projects. I will, I will talk about this in a little bit uh, later. Uh, so they might not be unrelated, but you might want to think about them as a separate entities even even uh, before that. So the next one uh, is the program, uh, which is essentially the uh, the Pumi code written in the language that you chose. So this is just the the, the different. Uh, let's say if, if it's a Python code, usually it's going to be one Python file. Might might be different Python files. Might be a library of Python files, etc. Doesn't really matter. But this is the the program that's going to uh, be executed for this project. And then we divide the project into stacks. Actually, not divide. We create projects into stacks. So a stack is essentially one instance of this project. So the easiest way to uh, kind of uh, create uh, 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 something that you uh, you can identify is like environments. You can create environments with stacks. So essentially you get different instances of the same project. 
uh, each stack would come with its own configuration. So they would be different, they, they would be separate, etc. but they would all, all rely on the same program. So they would have all the same uh, logical um, entities inside the, inside the Pumi program. So you need to be careful if you want to create an extended stack, then you need to create some different programs, etc. This is easily done because as I said, you can create libraries from Pumi. You can create, uh, you can use a single, let's say, class uh, of object that, that's something that you want to reuse in other projects. So we don't need to create anything, everything from scratch. But the logical organization in Pumi, it's how it's going to be deployed, et cetera, it's going to be a program. So it's going to be the same code. Um, so this is the uh, the stack. Then we have the resource. So this is the smallest um, uh, atomic uh, unit that you can uh, manage. And this is uh, the, the resource is a single manageable infrastructure item. So essentially, uh, it could be a configuration item for some uh, infrastructure component. It could be an entire service, or it could be uh, some hardware or something analogous to hardware, let's say an entire, let's say uh, firewall or something like that. So each resource could be one of many things. Uh, it's not one-to-one -one mapping, let's say to a specific service. So when we're talking about resources, I'm going to uh, explain why this is important because the, the Pumi service that Pumi charge for, they, they base this, uh, their charge on, on per resource. So essentially it's important to understand that there, there will be more resources in your project than uh, there are actual items, let's say. So if you have different configurations for a specific service, it might create more than one resource. It's going to create more than one resource. And of course, uh, each resource would uh, then run on um, a predefined uh, structure and predefined um, path and, and uh, algorithm. And of course, resources would have dependencies and uh, to, to, have, uh, to, to retain these dependencies, you would have inputs and outputs. Those are not separate entities. Uh, so so they, they cannot be, you cannot create uh, inputs and outputs from, from nothing. They are always assigned, uh, they always come from uh, objects from Pumi. Um, the idea is that inputs and outputs, they're essentially uh, an abstract uh, object which could be, for example, uh, a string integer or something that's hard coded as a raw volume, a raw volume. Uh, or it could be something that's uh, asymmetrically computed after it's being created. So something that's uh, provisioned and, and, it's, and it's available on, uh, after provisioning, not uh, before that. Or it could be, for example, uh, you can always uh, use inputs uh, as, uh, sorry, uh, you can use outputs for, for the input uh, of another uh, resource. So each resource would always accept arguments as, as inputs. And by default, this, this could be, for example, a string, but it could be also an input, uh, sorry, an output from another resource. And you can think of outputs as uh, something like a promise. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Essentially, this is something that's going to be computed asynchronous, asynchronously and it's going to be available at a later time. So you might not get the actual value uh, at the time of returning the code. So this is something that the Pumi engine is going to uh, compute at some point and is going to create the resource based on it. So these are the uh, different components. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, input and outputs while we are doing the, the session. So this is the logical organization. Uh, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> run through this uh, slide. And so this is the architectural organization of Pumi. Pumi is divided into uh, a front end and back end. Um, I'm going to discuss first for the front end. So we have uh, the front end is uh, based from uh, the language roles. This is the language that you chose, plus the program that's going to be written in, in this language. Uh, then you have uh, the CLI and the engine. And these are the, the driving parts that are going to uh, create your resources from, from your uh, code. Um, so the front end, uh, 
Yeah, sorry, the, the language host is uh, responsible for running the Pumi uh, program that you're going to, uh, going to uh, create. And it's going to set up the environment where it can register the resources into um, the deployment engine, and uh, sorry, with the deployment engine. And it's going to uh, run essentially your code. And so the, the, the language host is essentially just one runtime um, library from this uh, particular language that you're going to choose. Uh, the deployment engine and the COI, uh, actually the deployment engine is, is part of the COI uh, by default. And it, it, it's actually the intermediary between uh, the, 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 the runtime of the, of the language and the backend, which I'm going to discuss in a little bit, in a little bit and the uh, actual providers. So the, the different cloud providers or if not cloud providers, whatever provider it is. So uh, a resource provider, uh, sorry, uh, the backend uh, is uh, essentially the uh, stateful management of your resources. So it has different options for a backend. I'm going to uh, discuss the different options for a backend in the next slide. Uh, but essentially they, the backend provides your uh, stateful, uh, stateful record of your state uh, of your uh, resources. So uh, this is something that's going to be consistent to whatever your actual resources is. And this is uh, the backend going to be consulted by the, the engine uh, with each operation. And if there is no record, it's going to be created a record in, inside the, the state uh, management. And then you have the uh, resource providers, which the engine create. Uh, sorry, the agent call, the engine calls. Uh, the engine calls them through uh, CRUD operations. Uh, those are uh, create, read, update, and delete operations. They are atomic operations. They should finish and would would be uh, self uh, self sufficient, so they they would not uh, require any other uh, operation. Um, the different providers themselves are actually plugins uh, that are going to be uh, included into your uh, code. So this is, the, the engine is one, one type of, uh, uh, the, the engine is one type of uh, runtime that's going to be uh, used in your uh, programs, but you also have the plugins for each provider. So they, they will provide you with the uh, necessary SDK for the different resources and their mappings to objects into your uh, language. So that they, they, they are going to be uh, responsible for that. Um, a, re a resource plugin is essentially um, a binary used by the deployment engine to manage the resource. So they, they are going to uh, interact with, uh, with the actual uh, cloud infrastructure. So the engine just is going to call the providers to, to, to do the, to, for them to do the, the, the job that's going to be uh, assigned to them. So I talked about that there are uh, a few different options for a backend. Um, so what is by default is the Pumi service. And the Pumi service is a, a managed service which is presented by Pumi, uh, the company Pumi, not the, the software stack. And the company presents this uh, service with different tiers of uh, uh, subscription models that you can uh, apply to. Um, so I'm going to break a little bit the presentation and I'm going to go to the Pumi site just to let you know what exactly the Pumi subscription models are. So if you go to pricing, you're going to see that for individual, and this is something that's um, only for one person and doesn't have cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. The service is free uh, with some limitation. You need to check the, um, the small details. I forgot the name, the EU uh, for, for this service. But if you are going to use the uh, Pumi uh, service as a team or with uh, professional uh, mindset and professional uh, purpose, then you need to uh, subscribe to one of those uh, different uh, tiers. The Pumi uh, credits that you're going to use, they're uh, bought for certain price and they are 
depends per resource item. So essentially, that's why I, I told you that it's important that you have more resources than the actual, let's say, items, infrastructure items in, in your uh, project. So essentially, uh, they, they charge per resource item per one hour. So for one hour management of one resource, it's going to cost you one credit and you get one 150,000 150, uh, free credits for with the team uh, subscription and you get different kinds of uh, with the other ones. So you need to check them if you want to grow your team or if you have more demand for resources. Uh, those 150,000 free credits essentially amount to something like 200 resources uh, per month for free. So this is a, a small project or maybe a few small projects, but that's all. And after that, you need, need to pay uh, your whatever credits you need to get to uh, manage your resources. So going back to the presentation. So what is the Poomi? Um, service what, what actually adds to the to the um, to the table and what brings to the table on the Pumi service it's adding easy management of, the, of your projects and their resources you get uh, visual representations uh, you get um, easy uh, management in terms of creation in terms of uh, setting up um, different boundaries, etc. But you can tag the projects and you can create some logic organizations, etc. Um, you can, of course, create uh, your own uh, Pumi backend. And the different Pumi backends, aside from the Pumi service, which is the managed service presented by Pumi, you can also use S3. Uh, you can use local file storage, you can use uh, Azure blobs, etc. But they are all flat storages and they do not give you much of the management stuff that you're going to get from Pumi service. So this is how they make money from this software. Um, of course, all of those backends that are available uh, besides the Pumi service are free to use. They are open source. But if you're going to use the Pumi service, you need to subscribe to their uh, management service. Also, there is a possibility if you are using Pumi service, but you don't want, because this is a managed service uh, from Pumi, you get to open it in, in their uh, domain and work through internet, etc. If you don't want to, or the client doesn't want to use uh, public infrastructure, uh, the, the Pumi cloud service, let's say, uh, you can always uh, use Pumi service in your local, uh, you can deploy it locally, you can uh, on-prem, uh, which which you need to create some resources to deploy the Pumi service locally, but this is only with subscription model. So you need to pay it, but you can uh, deploy it locally and manage it locally, etc. So uh, I was talking about what it brings to the table. It's easy management for the projects and their resources. Uh, it, of course, creates state management, so uh, records the state, keeps it consistent and backs it up regularly. So in case of, um, let's say, outages, you can uh, restore your uh, state management into the way it was before the outage. Can be used for collaboration between teams uh, because you have multiple users, you can have multiple users, of course, and you can create different teams and you can um, collaborate between the different teams on the same project, you can share projects, etc. So this is something that you're going to use because on, on the back end, that's let's say S3, you don't get this kind of cooperation, you need to manage it through access to the S3, for example, etc. And this is something that is going to uh, be done by you and not come out of the box. Also, it creates, uh, it has easy integrations with uh, different systems like CI CD uh, tools and uh, other systems like uh, repositories, etc. So you have very easy integrations through the Pumi service. You get like I said, nice graphical views of some stuff. You can you get to see uh, all of the uh, resources, configurations, and all of those stuff uh, through the service. Also, you get notifications and such. Uh, let's say if you have a failed uh, project or if you want to do something that's triggering a specific notification, etc. Also provides out of the box, uh, the Pumi service provides out of the box auditing for your um, 
project, so you have different users. Of course, you have rolled back access control to those services, to who has access to the to the project, who has access to the stack, etc. And for those, you would have auditing for for the actions that have been taken, etc. And this is going to create um, for your security purpose. Uh, it's going to uh, check all of the marks that that are necessary. There is also out of the box uh, encryption that's going to be uh, taken care of uh, with Pumi service. They provide uh, their default uh, secret manager and secret uh, encryption uh, service. And you don't need to worry about those things uh, because they are going to be provided to you. If, you, if you're using now, if you're using the S3 or Azure Blob as, as, as a backend, then you need to configure the S3 for uh, encryption, and then you need to make sure that, uh, let's say, in transit, in transit is also encrypted, et cetera. Well, Pumi's service has done that for you. So these are the services that's going to be created, uh, the, sorry, the, to be uh, presented to you for, for when you are using the Pumi service backend. And of course, there is the uh, continuous operation model of Pumi service, so there shouldn't be any downtime, etc. Well, you need to take care, for example, if you if you have downtime on your other services that are using the for, for used for backend, then you need to uh, take care to make them uh, highly available, etc. So uh, I talked about. Um, how the part of the um, front end is the CLI and the, and the engine, and they were outside of the language host, which essentially um, you create a program with uh, Pumi and you have to run it through Pumi CLI. And this might not seem like a very nice way to uh, actually create the program with your language of preference, but because you, it, you require some external uh, tooling like the CLI to do uh, the tasks that you're going to do, like deployment or uh, checking the differences, et cetera. So Pumi has uh, the default workflow, which is using the CLI and you create the program, but then run the CLI and run commands through CLI to, to do all of the tasks that are going to be done to the project and to the stacks. And of course, this is not a very convenient way if you are going to do uh, some kind of automation with CICD or some kind of uh, service that you need to create, etc. So they have uh, a thing called Automation API, which is essentially, uh, you can think of it as integrating the uh, CLI into, uh, into, uh, an, into the SDK of uh, Pumi and then uh, inputting it inside the program. So essentially it's going to be running all of the steps inside the program that you're going to develop instead of creating uh, resources, et cetera, through the CLI. So this is going to uh, change the way you interface with the UMI. Uh, on the left, you interface with the CLI. On the right, you interface directly with the program uh, via HTTP, if it's a service that's running, uh, via uh, directly running the program, if you want to run directly the program, or with CICD, you're going to use to, to execute the program or something like that. So it, it depends on how you're going to develop your Pumi code and what type of Pumi code you're going to develop. So uh, this automation API essentially creates uh, the opportunity to define entire Pumi programs uh, even within your code base. So for example, the application code and the Pumi code could be in the same uh, program and in, in the same uh, routine that is going to be run. This this is very useful to create, uh, let's say, self deployment programs or self deployment services within, within one uh, deployment program, et cetera. Um, it removes the, the need for CLI. So for example, uh, in the standard flow, you need to deliver the CLI, you need to install the CLI and you need to configure it, et cetera, before you start running the, uh, the commands that you need to run. While if you're using the automation API, it's just one more thing to import in, into your code as a library and then run through the commands that you're going to use. So this is something that's very convenient. And also the Pumi, uh, you interact with the Pumi engine through the 
program and no longer through the CDI, uh, through the uh, COI because uh, you're using the program as, a, as an entry point. So it creates a lots of opportunities to create different scenarios that are otherwise not available easily with the COI. So this is the automation API, a very useful feature. I'm not going to have much time to uh, elaborate on how to create one, etc. We'll have some time on, on the coding session for it, but it's going to be a very small part because we don't have much time to do a full blown automation API service or something like that. So uh, we're, when we're talking about Pulumi and let's um, be real and let's say uh, what's actually Pulumi is uh, different to other solutions and most of the time it's compared to Terraform because Terraform has very similar features and very similar approach to some stuff and uh, essentially it's going to be mostly compared to those uh, to, to, to that uh, solution and to do that uh, let's go through one of the main differences in uh, Pulumi and Terraform so one of the first differences that we talked about since this is a, a language that you're going to use and you can actually implement libraries, you can uh, share just simple objects, you can share uh, entire packages, etc. So the, the way you reuse code is very different because you can granularly deploy different pieces of the code into your different uh, projects. So you don't need to um, you don't need to worry how much you're going to reuse and you can reuse different parts different pieces so it's very used to reuse it's very easy to reuse uh, uh code within Pulumi. so terraform of course has their own uh modules however the flexibility the flexibility is more uh on the Pulumi side of course the new hashicorp uh, language creates some kind of flexibility that's added to this i haven't had much time to invest into this language and i cannot say how how uh, flexible it is in terms of reusability but again this is something that you can reuse in terms of your ecosystem if your language so if it presents very easy reusability then it's going to be the same for your Pulumi code as well so this is uh, one of the points that's very unique to uh, this approach since this is an actual code, actual programs, you can use all the tooling that you use with your code if you are developing uh, an application or something like that. So you can use uh, uh, unit testing, uh, integration testing, you can use um, code coverage scans, you can use uh, code smell scans, etc. So all of this can be done through uh, Pumi, with Pumi because now you are using code and you can actually adopt the same policies that you have for your developers let's say you have standards that are set and you can ex execute these same standards on your infrastructure as code while on terraform and uh, this is not exactly the case so you have more limited um, testing capabilities let's say different uh, code coverage capabilities etc so you don't really get this kind of benefit of, of your native language that you're going to use. Uh, another difference is the uh, automation API, which I talked about. So essentially, we're going to create, uh, you can create a, a Pumi program in, let's say, Python, and it's going to be the actual program that's going to do whatever the Pumi is doing uh, with your infrastructure, with your cloud provider. So this is a very useful feature. You can create very nice scenarios uh, that are going to be beneficial to your uh, organization or to your clients. Then you have the ID support and the tooling support. This is a very kind uh, of kind of specific feature because now this is not something that's uh, provided by Pumi. This is a byproduct of the fact that you're using some language. So essentially, if I'm using uh, Python and I have a favorite ID and I have a favorite uh, plugins for this ID, they would work out of the box with it. And there is no problem to work with whatever ID you prefer to, to use, etc., because they are going to use just native code. And this is not true for Terraform because you need to create your own uh, profile for or 
plug in for the ID that you're uh, going to use for Terraform because it's not going to be uh, the native language that's already implemented for this ID, etc. So this is a very ni nice and neat feature. Uh, it's coming as a byproduct that you're using just native language. And this is a feature called dynamic providers, which is something that's um, a very interesting feature uh, when you cannot work within the standard providers and there is some need to create uh, a custom resource which is dependent on something that's already uh, provisioned, etc. And this is um, this is a more in-depth topic. I'm not going to discuss uh, uh, advanced topic that I'm not going to discuss in depth. This is essentially hooking up procedures and resources to other uh, operations, CRUD operations. So it's creating more um, very custom operations within um, your procurement of infrastructure. And uh, this is going to help you create scenarios that are otherwise unavailable by the public APIs of the quad providers or something like that. Or for example, the, the, the SDK for the cloud provider, it doesn't provide it, but the API provides it and there is some difference, et cetera. You can always call external, um, external functionalities like uh, APIs from, from within dynamic providers and they, they would be uh, very useful in this case. I will talk about uh, specific dynamic provider when we start the coding session that could be useful in our case. So uh, talking about the uh, adoption and the comparison to Terraform, of course, we can talk about how to import or migrate to Pumi from other infrastructure as code solutions. That's one of the neat features about uh, Pumi. It has lots of uh, options you can use for uh, heterogeneous environments or if you want to move entirely to Pumi, et cetera. So they, they have different approaches. So the first one is they can coexist with any other infrastructure as code solution. You can reference most of the other uh, solutions um, like um, CloudFront or uh, sorry, CloudFormation or uh, uh, Terraform, etc., because they have uh, well-defined uh, stateful um, descriptions of their resources, so they can uh, reference. You can reference uh, those objects. Uh, which are external to the Pumi uh, ecosystem and you would get the necessary uh, inputs from them. So uh, just a moment, I'm going to open on the browser uh, a list of all of the supported uh, coexisting, uh, sorry. Okay, so there is a list of uh, a chart of all of the supported infrastructure as code solutions that you can directly reference. So these are directly referencing the state from uh, this is the support matrix for 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 the, for the different technologies. So you you can directly reference uh, on the supported uh, infrastructure infrastructure as code uh, technologies, some of them you can directly reference the state from them. So essentially interacting directly with the, let's say Terraform uh, to get the necessary information and to create your own uh, pool uh, infrastructure. Of course, there is also the option to get uh, to uh, use selectors and to get the, uh, the information from the cloud itself. So you can use, um, selectors from 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 within Pulumi, which would be essentially like creating a, a, a resource that's only read only and you just can read the data for this resource and you can get the information for this resource so this is the, the way you can use Pulumi alongside of any of the other solutions and they can coexist with uh, dependencies between them then there there is the option to import um, resources from external uh, services, or if you created the resources manually, you can re import the, the different resources as, as external objects, or you can import them from a specific language, like a specific tool like Terraform. For example, there is a tool uh, that's going to uh, read uh, all of the objects from the TF state file, for example, and going to import them into your Pumi um, stateful management. So there is the option to import the object 
topics into your uh, state management. And of course, the, the final option is to convert entirely the, the code that's been written into uh, Pumi code. This is done by, again, some kind of transcoder that are supported for uh, Pumi. There is, uh, for example, a transcoder that's used for uh, converting HCL code to Pumi code, for example, and you just parse, uh, not parse, but uh, process the code and it's going to produce you your Pumi code in the native language that you wish. Uh, that you wish. Uh, so there is a small um, uh, constraint uh, regarding those transcoders and uh, this implies also for the import tool as well, and that is going to be targeting specific um, languages uh, and specific solutions. They are constrained by the versions that, that they operate. So, for example, the uh, transcode uh, tool for uh, hash, uh, hashi corp language, the hash corp language, could be limited to a particular version of the language. And of course, you would be limited to a particular version in, in Pumi as well. So you need to make sure that you are within this range so you can use that, use it to uh, tra translate the code to your uh, Pumi native code. So this is the, the way to um, actually migrate from another solution or coexist with another solution. So essentially in a summary, what, what is what we talked up until now, I'm going to give you a list of good reasons why you should use Pumi. There, there is, this is not exhaustive list. This is just just the thing that we talked about. There are a lot more things that could be uh, beneficial to you. So one of the first reason is you get the benefits of your uh, functional programming languages. So uh, essentially, um, you get whatever you can do with the, the programming language you can do with uh, Pumi. So that that's one of the big. Uh, benefits of this approach. Of course, you can do this with hash corporate language, but uh, hash corp language, but of course, for me at least, it, it didn't seem all that uh, easy to learn another uh, language and the learning curve is more uh, unless you already knew it or something like that. But usually, since I already know this language or that language and it's adoptable by Pum, it's easier to uh, implement. So you can create complex dependencies between application and infrastructure easily with, with this kind of uh, solution as Pulumi. Then there is the uh, secure by default when you use Pulumi service. Uh, when you don't use Pulumi service, it's not that hard to secure it. Encryption is not that hard with the different backends. Uh, even in transport, it's not that hard to, to implement, etc. But if you're using the Pumi service, you get encryption uh, by default. You get role-based role -based access control to your resources and your configuration items by default. You have secret management. You, you get all of this by default from your Pumi service. Then you have the option to use your favorite tooling and software that you've been familiar with, and you're going to de develop the infrastructure with the same tooling. And of course, this is a benefit to companies that have mass licenses for specific tooling, etc. because you can reuse this tooling and it's not going to cost you anything because it's just, you just need to support the, the ID need to support the, the language that, you're, that you chose. So uh, another very useful feature that we talked about, you can create a validation test called cover standards to your code uh, whatever the policies you have, you, you can apply them to your code. And that's very useful because you don't have to develop separate policy for infrastructure code. And you get the, get, get the same day access to resources through some of the providers. Uh, of course, you can always use dynamic providers if you don't have access to some specific feature. And you also can create an entire new provider if you want to, or just some resources to the new provider or something like that. So you can easily extend the functionality of Pumi. Um, then uh, I talked about uh, creating uh, the dynamic, dynamic providers, which are very, very nice feature, but it's more advanced and it's very uh, niche case for some, but it could be very life saving feature for, for others because it's a very useful useful approach and you can create more complex resources with it you can create composite resources etc which are uh, 
they were fit for your organization and your project or whatever you're working on. Um, the same way you can build for CI CD processes, you can also build uh, self service infrastructures, uh, APIs, and portals uh, for developers and other uh, users. So you can build entire services on, let's say, Python and let's say uh, Flask or something like that that use Pumi, and you can create your own uh, um, infrastructure as a, soft, as a service uh, solutions that rely on your use cases and you can create them as APIs or web portals or something like that. And you can create very, very useful scenarios for your uh, organization project, whatever. So imagine some API that's exposing uh, infrastructure, logical infrastructure components like um, entire microservice or a set of services or something like that. And you just call the API, it's returning you the, the, the code that's the, the infrastructure and the code that's being deployed uh, and it's ready and you just use it uh, with whatever other code you're developing. Or for example, if a user goes to a web portal, clicks on some picture that's representing some kind of uh, service and in, in the back you get the Pumi doing call of the deployment of the infrastructure and then the deployment of the code, etc. and returning to the user the entire solution after it's uh, procured. So very, very nice to create not only CI/CD uh, implementations with Pumi, but all kinds of uh, features and stuff that you can do with it. And of course, you can use uh, inline uh, procedures in your code, um, with, with, with which you can use uh, self deploying uh, cloud native applications. And you don't need to rely on uh, CI CD tooling, for example, for clients that don't have expertise in them. You can create an entire process and an entire uh, deployment process for, for Pumi. And with very easy management, you can deliver those to, to your clients. So you can create very easy deployable uh, software to, to the client with this. So uh, this is pretty much the theoretical presentation that I've, I was going to talk about. Any questions so far? If it's a small question, sorry, let's see in the chat. Uh, I see no questions in the chat. Anybody want to ask anything? Let's see how we are with time. Uh, excuse me, may I ask you? So yep. as I understand, uh, the Pulumi, self-hosted Pulumi is paid, uh, am I right? So the self-hosted Pulumi service is paid. So uh, the Pulumi service is essentially the uh, backend that's being developed by Pulumi, which is uh, all of the features that I told you about, project management, role-based access control users, etc. all of this, uh, they present it as a package. If you don't want to use their uh, cloud uh, inf infrastructure and their service in, in the cloud, you can get it as a, as a local uh, deployable uh, software, but you still need to pay for uh, the, the, the subscription. So essentially you just host it on your local environment or local servers or whatever for let's say security uh, constraints. Uh, like for example, you are a bank and you don't want to uh, host data that's going to be uh, relevant to your bank outside of your organization, etc. So it is paid and you can host it on your site. But if you are using one of the free open source backends, like um, the flat storage ones, like uh, Bob or S3, etc., they are not paid, they are free. But you okay. need to, yeah, but you need to create, uh, you need to create them and you need to uh, make sure that let's say if, if you're concerned you can encrypt them encrypt in transit let's say so we create uh, https for for the s3 or something like that and all of this you need to do yourself or if you need to have different teams you need to create policies who can access this s3 etc so this is the the thing that they present to you you get uh, just flat out on backend for free and all the goodies with the pulmi service okay thanks okay Okay, uh, any Hi. other questions? Yeah, uh, hello. Yeah, hello. So uh, I have a question about when we go back to the comparison of the Pulumi and uh, Terraform. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, pros of Pulumi. Uh, could you also mention 
what are the cons uh, in comparison to the Terraform? Uh, I would say the most, uh, it, it, this is my personal view because I cannot uh, say for whatever is the, the con, it, is that the, the Pumumi service, which is a um, very uh, nice feature, but it also has like some very like um, necessary features are paid. So you get the, the flat backend, but you have to do some work to, to make it more presentable and more up to date and up to standards. Of course, it's very easy to do some of the things, but you have to do them. And this is breaking a little bit of, um, of, of the functionality for me, but not that much that it's not easily doable. You just need to think of how you want to present it and how you want to, to deploy it, the pool infrastructure itself. So this is one of the, the, the cons for me. Uh, other uh, problem I see is that sometimes the, the, the actual providers that you use, they, they have their own uh, issues. Uh, like for example, they don't have any, uh, they have very small or any kind of uh, output when uh, they, uh, when you face an exception and it's very hard to debug with them because that's what actually the provider, the, the plugin provider gets you. And it's not a problem actually of pulling you, it's a problem of the providers, but they, they present very, uh, very small information about what, what went wrong and what's, what's the problem. Um, another problem, um, I don't know, per perhaps there are many cons to, to the Pumi, but it's up to you to decide if it's actually something that's uh, going to be a problem for you or it's, uh, if it's a deal breaker, et cetera. So I can't really say for other people what would be the cons uh, compared to Terraform. And for me, it seems like more flexible too, but with less adoption than Terraform compared to Terraform, but it's gaining traction. So it's getting more adoption. So. That's, that's for me, the, the take that I can get from my personal experience. Okay, um, any other questions? Because I want to start the uh, coding session if possible. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of free use of Pogomi, mm -hmm. do you use automation API or we should only use like Pogomi CLI? Uh, they are both free. So it's up to you to decide how you want to um, design your Pumi code. The CLI is the, breaking a little bit on the um, automation cycle for me, but it's still a valid, uh, valid approach because the CLI doesn't re require interaction. You can do this uh, programmatically as well, but you can think of it, you have the Pumi code in, in whatever language you're typing, and then you have the CLI that's going to execute this Pumi code. So it's a little bit more complex and it's not so, um, let's say, monolith in terms of, okay, this is a language and this is an SDK. So you have external component. But if you use automation API, you, you essentially just integrate all of this into the code. And this is, of course, necessity if you are going to build a service, let's say. So if I'm going to create a infrastructure as a service, uh, entirely and I want to create it uh, for my organization, then I need to use automation API because I have to run a Pumi program on let's say Python continuously and not call just Pumi uh, CLI commands and something. Not that I cannot do it, but it's better to have it uh, run natively in the actual language or something like that. But both are free, so they are not paid. The only paid thing is the Pumi service which is the backend for, for uh, um, which gets you the goodies that I told you about. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have enough time. Hopefully we would, we would but um, I, I guess I talked a little bit too much. Uh, so I have a, a small presentation, small, but still going to take time uh, for a small project, which uh, I, picked out from one of my tinkering, et cetera, with Python. So I, I have a, a small um, software, which I divided into a front-end and back-end. 
I adopted it to uh, AWS Lambda. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with AWS Lambda. This is a, a runtime that's being exposed. Essentially, it exposes a, a set of a set of uh, runtimes with different languages uh, that are going to execute a specific function, not entire uh, software uh, stacks or services or something like that. So once the, the, the function um, is run, the, the runtime concludes the, the execution and charges you only on CPU time. And I created, um, I have a code that I adopted to AWS Lambda, then I created a front end, a very simple front end, and I'm very bad at it. So don't judge me about the, the look, how it looks uh, on JavaScript jQuery. That's going to call the, the front end and it's going to be deployed in S3, which is going to be a publicly available S3 and going to host a static site. Then uh, because the, the uh, code that I written in, in, in the backend, so to speak. We have a bunch of libraries that are not coming in AWS Lambda, so I had to create an external layer for, for those, um, for those uh, libraries. And I'm, I have to create an execution role for the Lambda function to be able to uh, run with specific writes, to be able to write to the S3 bucket. And finally, I'm going to have to create an API gateway, which is going to interact uh, as an intermediary between the Lambda and the user, because up to recently, I think a month or two, I think a month ago, uh, Lambdas could not be called externally unless from CLI or something like that. So essentially you call Lambda, but you call it from a gateway and in fact, the way you call Lambda is with a post function. So essentially you expect a get request from the Lambda, but you are sending a get request for, for, the, for the service the Lambda represents, but you do it with a post function for, for the Lambda, for example. And it's something that the API gateway do for you and it's doing it well. Recently, they added a feature that you can actually call the Lambdas as normal, normal, um, services, et cetera, which are uh, presenting your code. Um, the backend is uh, a REST API that they've created is a REST API function. And the user is going to download the static code, then the static code is going to uh, call the backend and is going to create uh, an image. The project is called Mandelbrot. It's a fractal. I don't know if you're familiar what fractals are. Just a side note, it's a very uh, interesting topic for me. I, I like, I, I love math, I, lo I love algorithms, etc. So fractals are very interesting subsection, sub, uh, not subsection, sub, uh, field of uh, mathematics. They have very useful features. Uh, one of them um, is very uh, applicable to our profession. It's used in encryption and cryptography. Uh, Another feature which uh, specifically is used in, in uh, it, it, it stems from, from the Mandelbrot fractal uh, is that it's observing um, a very, uh, various processes in nature and um, some kind of evolutions of systems, etc. cetera, based, uh, you can uh, study them based on fractals. Uh, it's called uh, the bifurcation uh, diagram. I'm going to send you a link later if you want to see what it is. And of course, for, for me, the, the, fun of the, the fun of it is because it's very beautiful, it's very relaxing and creates a very nice images. So you get a very interesting stuff. So uh, going from uh, our presentation, I'm going to open Visual Studio. I uh, hope you see my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yep, sure. Yes. Sure. Okay, so uh, we're going to go through the setup process of Pumi. Um, I'm going to skip the installation of the Pumi CLI. Uh, first, uh, this is a very straightforward process. You just go to the uh, Pumi uh, site, download the Pumi code, or use the Pumi package manager, which is using um, chocolate uh, or choc chocolate. I don't remember what the package manager was for Windows then install it, et cetera. The configuration part is more important than the actual CLI, et cetera. Also, I'm going to use AWS, as I mentioned before. So I have already prepared AWS CLI and uh, I've connected it to my uh, account. So I'm already connected to uh, AWS and I can use uh, my AWS resources. I have my console here just to observe the uh, effects of the um, Pumi program and 
this is my uh, code structure. We have the backend, which is a Python, uh, which is going to run on Lambda. His, here is our uh, Lambda handler, which is going to be the entry point for the Lambda function. It's returning uh, a get, uh, it's uh, intended for a get request. It's returning a specific uh, a string and it's creating an image. And then we have the front end, which is uh, essentially just this static website that has only one configuration where to find the back end and it's going to run and it's going to get the, the image from the, sorry, the string for the image for the, uh, from the back end and it's going to display it in, in to the browser. So uh, I'm going to create uh, a, a single project in Pumi. And to do that, I already have the CLI in mind. Uh, it's created, it's it's installed. So I'm going to go to the Wumi directory. It's gonna be an empty directory and I'm going to create a new project. So uh, so if you do just pull menu, it's going to present you with a bunch of uh, options. Uh, you can choose a, a bunch of templates for a new project and it's going to present you an options for, let's say you want to write in Python and you want to do it in AWS, or you want to write in uh, Go and you want to do it in Azure, et cetera. So you get a bunch of templates. They are boilerplates for a project of this type. So just creating all of the boilerplate before it's starting. But I don't know, I know already what I want to do. So I want to do uh, an AWS with Python. So this is my uh, template and this is going to create uh, my structure. So it's going to ask me for a, a project name. I'm going to call the project name Mandelbrot. <laughs> it's going to <clears throat> ask for a description. <clears throat> I'm going to call it fractal display. <clears throat> then it's going to present a default stack. So this is, once you have one stack, the project is active. And if you delete the last stack in the project, the project is going to be deleted. And this is something that's going to be done automatically. So this is in the Pumi search. I forgot to mention, I'm using right now the Pumi service. Uh, but if I was to use, let's say a local storage or S3 bucket, the thing that I'm going to do before the Pumi new is going to be Pumi login, which I did, but I did it with the Pumi service. I'm using it as, as individual. So now I'm connected to the Pumi service. But if I was going to use local storage, I'm going to then do an option with Pumi login, then local or something, and it's going to use my local storage for, for the backend. So I'm going to create a dev stack and it's asking what region I'm going to use. I'm going to use EU central one and it's going to save the configuration into a pumi.yaml file and it's going to create a virtual environment for my python uh, so i can work within the virtual environment and it's going to create a boilerplate for my default code so this is going to happen right now uh, it creates different files, uh, configuration files for each Pumi uh, stack. So I have a Pumi dev YAML. Uh, and if I had like QA or prod or let's say uh, instance one YAML, then I'm going to have a different file for those. And inside of this file, it's going to uh, keep the configuration for, for, this, uh, for this stack. Inside of the project, it, you can keep the tags, you, you can pack the projects, you can group them, etc., by some com common properties, etc. So essentially, this is uh, the configuration files when you are using a Pumi CLI. When you're using automation API, you need to read them from somewhere else. So you, you don't have Pumi uh, configuration files because you don't have Pumi CLI and you're running everything from the code. So you can use environment files or something like that to create the configuration for Pumi. So this is the uh, main program that's going, to, uh, that's going to, the template is going to create for me. And it's a very simple one that's uh, creating just an S3 bucket. This is a boilerplate. So uh, just a moment, I need to select my uh, interpreter so I don't get all those warnings and I'm going to choose um, okay so this is my boilerplate for for uh, my code and now we're going to start coding the uh, project that we have so we have um, 
S3 bucket, we have Lambda function, we have API gateway. So these are three main components, but they have more than three resources because there are many things that come along with actual services. So we need to create them as well. So um, I'm just going to add a JSON package to my uh, import because I'm going to need some functions from the JSON. Uh, then I'm going to use in the Pumi package uh, because I'm going to use some functions from there as well. The AWS uh, plugin that I'm going to use because we are going to deploy to AWS, I'm going to call it uh, AWS, not S3, because we are going to use a lot more features from there, not just on the uh, buckets. And then I'm going to import uh, one uh, library that I created beforehand. Uh, this is a, not a library, it's a bunch of functions that I'm going to use because I don't have time to type them all. So um, I'm just going to pull my function. So uh, this is uh, just a bunch of functions that return a map uh, which has a JSON structure. And I'm going to use a few of them because they, they are simplifying my creation of resources. Some of them are necessary. Some of them, for example, like this one, uh, this is uh, um, an open, open API export of, of, of API gateway because I don't want to create a bunch of small resources to create the gateway and I have to do it. So I'm just going to use an export that I did before and I'm just going to replace a very few uh, values so that they match my case. Essentially, these are functions that return, uh, you can think of them as JSON object, but essentially a map, uh, key value maps. And inside these key value maps, I can replace a certain um, certain value so they get, get uh, replaced uh, with the actual values when, when it's created. So the first thing that I'm going to create, uh, So uh, I'm going to need a bucket, which I'm going to call result bucket. And this is going to be an AWS bucket, uh, sorry, S3. So what's happening in just a moment? I need to check why I don't get the uh, completion. Ivalo, I'm so sorry, yep. we have just 10 minutes left. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to then, <laughs> I was hoping I would have the time for, for the full uh, coding session. So I'm just going to then deploy the code from my Git repository and I'm going to go over it quickly because it's going to be, a lot of time to fully code the session. I would, I just wanted to show you the the benefits of uh, the ID that you can get from uh, from your um, whatever ID of choice you have. Like for example, when you use a specific uh, function and you want to see the uh, documentation for the function, you get all of this from the ID and it's easy to understand. You get, of course, if it's documented properly and has documentation you get out completion, you get everything that you need. So uh, that's that's the, the one of the benefits that I wanted to show you. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. So I'm just going to use the direct, uh, the, the end result of this, uh, uh, of this, project. So what we have here is one result bucket, which is a bucket object and that's going to be used later on within the uh, one of the roles. And we're going to create one one the row that we talked about, which is the execution role for the Lambda function. 
then uh, we're going to create two policies. One policy is to write logs for, for the Lambda function. And then the other is actually the more important one. It's going to use the same buckets to be able to apply uh, the results that I'm going to create within the Lambda function into the bucket. So it's going to store the, the pictures into the bucket. Then I'm going to create one Lambda uh, library, uh, which is essentially a, a Lambda layer. And this is a, a, the same as Lambda, but it doesn't have an entry point. It's just a group a bunch of functions, or sorry, a bunch of modules uh, which are stored into uh, one uh, Lambda layer and it's used as, as external uh, library. So essentially it's something like linking to a library in, inside of uh, a Lambda. I've already prepared those beforehand because it's a pain to do it uh, while we are doing the whole session. So there are two zip files, the, the, the function and the uh, layer. Here is the function. Um, the function uh, is going to reference the layer because it's going to use the layer. And I'm going to uh, point to the handler, to the Lambda function handler that's going to execute the code. Then I'm going to display uh, all of the properties that I need for my um, Lambda function. It's going to run on Python 3.8. Uh, it's going to have a timeout of 600 uh, seconds and it's going to use uh, x8464 architecture and going to take the code from here. And finally, it's going to uh, create an environment variable for the Lambda function, which is going to point out to the bucket where to find the bucket and where to store the files from uh, its execution. So this is something that's going to be uh, added into the configuration of the Lambda uh, function. And here we have the uh, Lambda layer, which is being referenced in the layer. So it's going to include the layer into the function and it's going to bring all the libraries that are coming within the layer. Then I'm going to create a Mando API object, which is essentially a REST API gateway. And this is a, just an empty REST API gateway until I use this function, which returns my uh, export from uh, Swagger definitions. I can use either open API or Swagger, doesn't matter really. Uh, this creates a specific definition for our uh, API which uh, tells us which resources are going to be serviced, what type of uh, calls are going to be made, like get, what's the necessary uh, positional parameters, uh, query parameters, if there are any uh, responses, if there are, the response is going directly to the Lambda, so there is no interference between the uh, API gateway and the Lambda. And then I also create one response for course because I'm going to use different domains and I don't need to uh, worry about those. Then I'm going to create a deployment for this particular uh, setup configuration that we're going to use for the API gateway. And this is going to create one set uh, of resources that are going to be deployable in the API gateway. And I'm going to create an API stage. And you, you see how many little different components are added. These are different resources. And uh, these, each one of those, they contribute to the resource count of your Pulumi service. So you need to make sure that you have you prepare for, for how many resources you're going to handle, etc. And if I was using um, not this kind of function and export with uh, Swagger. I was going to create another five, six, maybe 10 more because there are lots of different small resources that I need to configure. There is a downside to this because this is not very modifiable. It's not flexible. Once I create this resource with this uh, export uh, with the API definition, it's not very modifiable. But for our presentation, it shortens my uh, or should have shortened my uh, code segment that I need to code. So I'm going to create a stage which would be called, which we will call dev. It's not the dev uh, stack that we're uh, referencing in our POMI. This is a dev stage in the API gateway. Essentially, it's going to create an instance for the API gateway for this particular deployment. And finally, I'm going to give uh, my uh, API gateway permissions to execute the Lambda function and to call the Lambda function. And that's pretty much it. Uh, after that, and uh, I didn't talk this uh, about this too much, uh, we had the uh, Pumi export, which is essentially how we uh, export values 
uh, output values or outputs from from our Pulumi stack uh, for for other stacks or for users or for other automations. So essentially, by exporting this value of this output, which I have here, and it's in type of output. Um, I'm exporting it for other systems values, uh, other uh, projects, and etc. So I need the bucket name and I need the API gateway URL, which, however, I'm modifying slightly with the lambda function here. And this is a Python lambda, not uh, AWS lambda. I'm doing a small uh, modification to append the um, stuck, uh, sorry, the stage from the API gateway and our uh, uh, resource. So it's going to return us the, resor the result. So once I'm done with this, I'm just going to execute Pumi up, which is going to give us an interactive response to what's going to happen. And we are going to get a, a, a question of what, what to do. We have yes, no, and preview, where preview or details is giving you a summary of what's going to happen. So essentially, if you're calling pull it preview is going to do the same thing as the details here. So this is what's going to be created. We have the pluses here. It's going to create 11 resources. It's going to create them in uh, the way, uh, in, in the sequence that's necessary. Uh, of course, you can uh, avoid this, the question by typing dash Y. This is going to be a, a non-interactive session uh, for the Pumi up. And up is for update, actually. So this is shortened for update. And this is going to create our stack with the, the configuration that we have. We actually don't have configuration. Uh, everything that's configuration is for the front end. And we need this variable here. We need this uh, export here for our front end to be able to know where to go to, where to reach the API gateway. So this is going to create our resources. And just bear for another two, three minutes, going to finish the entire project in, in a few minutes. Uh, so this is uh, our API gateway. It's already created. This is our bucket. If we go to the S3 and go to the bucket, we're going to see our bucket. It's appending a string to the name. This is by default, uh, so it, you get unique uh, names, even if you have the same names where, when we are creating the objects for the, for the buckets. And this is going to be a publicly accessible bucket because we need it to, we don't need to worry about uh, authentication, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't have anything on, on, uh, on the bucket right now. So this presents, however, a problem because this is, uh, an output variable that I need to put into a file, and then I need to uh, build my front end, and then I can deploy my front end. So, this was one of the good examples for a dynamic provider. Fortunately, this is going to take lots more time, so I don't have time to do it right now. So, I'm just going to go, oops, sorry, I'm going to go to my automation API directory, and I'm going to create my automation uh, API on top of the current Pumi. Uh, there are two ways you can create automation API. You can build it from scratch. You can in incorporate all the code in, into the program, or you can use already existing CLI program, program which is using Pumi and CLI, and you can create a wrapper on, on top of it to make it automation API so you can run it on uh, the language that you choose. You can even choose, let's say you built the Pumi uh, COI program in Go, but you run it in Python and you can create a bunch of stuff in the Python uh, program. So it's going to create the um, Python uh, automation API Pumi program. So I need to, oops. I need to restore my uh, my automation API because I don't have time to write it. So here it's how it, how it looks. We have only import of Pumi because we are not using any AWS resources here because this is a wrapper. But if you are going to use a you are going to create a, a native API. Uh, 
automation API program. It's going to be with uh, whatever plugin, etc. And you can see inside I have stack set, stack refresh. These are commands that are actually Pulumi CLI commands. So you can incorporate them in the code and you can run them as code. And essentially here we have stack destroy if I'm going to destroy the resources and stack up, which is essentially pull me up. So I'm done with this. And now I need to uh, just create my uh, virtual environment. Um, and need to download my dependencies and I can run the, 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 pool, the Python program and it's going to deliver my code, which is essentially, this is the, the last step that I uh, cannot do with the other program and I needed to do with dynamic provider. It's going to write into the uh, file configuration, file config.json. It's going to write the API gateway endpoints so the front end nowhere called the backend. And we have uh, another command, which is using the AWS CLI because I didn't have time to write uh, a provisioner for that to uh, upload the files to the S3 bucket, which are the, the static files. So um, I'm just going to download the requirements. And it's actually saying that it's already downloaded. Oh, actually, I haven't updated my environment, just a moment. And I'm going to the requirements. And I'm doing this with a separate virtual environment, so I don't have mix up between, between the Pumi uh, COI program and the Pumi automation API program, because let's say I want to have them in different components. And so now I have my Python program ready. And if I run it like this, uh, it should create whatever's part of the program, but it's already created by the execution with the COI, but it's also going to execute the final portion, which is going to create the file and is going to populate my uh, my project with, with the uh, front end. And finally, I can test the product. So that's, that's kind of the, the purpose of this uh, interactive session. Sorry about the uh, time that's taking for the interactive session. I really plan to do it, but I guess, it's taking too much time and I didn't want that much time. So I'm almost done and we can see the results once this is done. And of course, after that, we can finish the session. If you have any questions, you can ask now. You can see now this is the one of the final executions and it's uploaded the files. So I have my files here. Here's my index HTML. I'm going to open the index HTML. Here's my very crude index HTML. Don't judge me about it. It's very, very uh, crude. So I'm going to draft a piece of the plane that's going to be the Mandelbrot uh, fractal. And hopefully this would work. And it's starting. So yay, <laughs> yay for the, the program. And I'm going to show you what's actually done. We have the bucket which is created and we have the Lambda if it goes any time. Because uh, one of the things that I did is this is doing like 200 requests per second, uh, asynchronous request with a queue. So it's doing in parallel execution and it's going to divide the work into different Python executions, which is kind of the deal. Um, but uh, of course this is, uh, taking a toll on the browser. So it doesn't really respond very well after that. And even if you have like a thousand tabs. So here is my Lambda function, which is connected to the layer uh, and to the API gateway. We get our code inside, which is, uh, oops, sorry, uh, which is here. Ah, here is the code and I have our API gateway. So. Any questions so far? And so just to reiterate what, I, what we did here. So this is a Lambda, uh, sorry, this is a, a, a Python function which is using CLI. And inside, I don't have any uh, pull me CLI commands. It's just a Python function, sorry, a Python code, but it's callable from the CLI. So you need to use the CLI to, to execute this. And of course, this is 
more constrained than the other one. And the other one is actually uh, uh, overlay uh, a wrapper on top of this one, which is creating this uh, function as, as, as Python code. And I am calling natively Python and not a Puomi CLI anymore. So I can run a service which is a daemon and not just a program, etc. And I can do this with any kind of program. And of course, if I can, I, I can do this, I can also do the entire program within one. So it's going to be a, a Python code, but it's going to be executed uh, with all of the Puomi uh, crude actions for, for our AWS uh, resources. So uh, any questions? Final questions because I guess we are over the time. Any uh, is your example is somewhere on GitHub? Uh, no, actually, I have not uploaded it yet, but I will upload it to my GitHub as well. Uh, it's a you have tons of examples. I'm going to send uh, Arthur some links which are very useful for starting up with Pumi, but you have. Tons of examples. Uh, for example, this is an example of an automation API example with local program, which is what I did right now. There is uh, uh, examples with uh, direct inline code and other kinds of examples. Like there are one of the good things about Pumi has lots of examples in GitHub. You can just pick one as a boilerplate plate for your project and start working from there. So I can also upload my when I have time, I'm probably going to have time today to upload it, but I'm not sure. But you can get one of the predefined projects from Puomi as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? And just to make sure that this is a more dynamic, I'm going to input some other mapping of values and to show you that this program actually works and it's not just some static content. So let's say like this. And oops, sorry. It's not very flexible, so I need to refresh first. And if you have any questions at the time. What about uh, Plumi versions versus Python versions? Um, actually, I think they support whatever is supported by uh, Python, C Python, and I'm not entirely sure if uh, they disupport at some point the uh, C Python versions. But uh, and for sure they're working only with C Python for now. And I don't know if they're planning to use like um, uh, what was the the name the the Java Python interpreter. Giton or whatever, and other Python interpreters. But the versions of the supported, I guess, it's what's supported currently by, by the C Python community. So if they disregard any support for, for further support for the C Python, I guess it's not going to be supported by Pumi. But this is an SDK, so uh, you can always uh, go to the release notes and see the release notes. Okay, uh, I see in the chat a lot of activity. Oh yeah, that, that was, but I was going too fast and I was trying to code and you know how it is. It's not good to code under pressure. So yeah, happens. <laughs> Oops. I, if I saw this earlier, it's going to be faster, but again, we didn't have much, too much time. Are the differences in the speed of compilation between languages? Actually, uh, depends on how you're going to execute this. Uh, if you're going to use um, optimizations, let's say for Python, and it's going to use uh, already uh, the already compiled uh, pseudocode for Python is going to be very fast. Uh, for me, the, uh, the actual slowdown comes from the providers and the plugins, and some of them are slower than others and depends on how they are executed. So that's, that's the slowdown, but I don't know the difference between the languages. That's, that's something that you can probably do. It's very easy to time them, just write the same code for two different projects, time them with, let's say, time command in Linux, and it's going to show you the difference. 
Do you have experience in creating a big infrastructure with Pumi? Not exactly. I don't have experience with the big infrastructure. I have smaller kind of projects created with it. Does Pumi generate a state file like Terraform? No, the, the state file is actually the backend and the backend is sort of like JSON structured uh, inside of the, the backend. And big infrastructure, more than 2,000 resources is fine. It depends on how fast your backend is, of course, but it's not a problem to have more than 2,000 resources. The problem comes from the plugin, not so much from the uh, from the backend. So the plugin, of course, is doing asynchronously the requests as much as, as possible because they have dependencies. But again, sometimes it's the slowdown comes from there. So. And the cool thing is if, if you have slowdown from a synchronous request, you can break them down to different states. So you don't need to deploy all of the stuff together in, in botch up the network or whatever, the CPU or et cetera. And you can do them in chunks and you can do this in your program. So you can break it down to smaller logical units within the stack. So one more question. Uh, is it to... Pulum is like a one thread program, or it can paralyze, paralyze uh, like between your core, processor core, or something like this. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't get the question a little bit breaking down. Uh, okay, um, so uh, in comparing in Terraform uh, uh -huh. UI, uh, we have like uh, our execution file, uh, uh -huh. which execute like uh, in one thread, and you can Paralyze execution with special command. Uh, uh, does Pulumi Savai uh, has some feature or not? Uh, by default, you're executing asynchronously, so it's um, going to be uh, with with some multi-threading as well. But it's going to be uh, limited to default values. I think there is a, a setting how much you can set for for all of the calls, like um, a number which is going to be the, the maximum number of uh, asynchronous calls, um, but you can also, like I said, you can you can maintain your uh, deployment cycle within the functions of your code. So you can create different stages and you can target deploy some stuff before others or something like that. If you are worried for something that's going to be taking a lot of resources or something like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So you have some options to configure in in the um, in the Pumi engine, which is going to handle your calls to the uh, AWS plugin, and the plugin is going to call the provider. So sorry, the infrastructure provider. But essentially, uh, it depends on first. It depends on the plugin because the plugin is going to do the call. So we need to know how many the plugin supports. But I guess that it's um, configurable to an extent. I have to check exactly how much threads you can uh, have for our asynchronous calls. And of course, you can use threads in Python, but you have to be careful because uh, if you're doing two operations on uh, Pumi engine and it's going to lock the until one operation is done, it's going to lock the, the, the Pumi uh, state. So it's going to be, there is going to be uh, some race condition and of course some uh, synchronization be between those because it's not going to happen syn synchronously like that. And Python is not a very good, I mean, for, for, for multi-threading, uh, some simple stuff that are going to happen, yes, but uh, because of the global walk, uh, Python is not a very good idea to um, use for multi -training. Maybe multi processing, sure, but not multi -training. But for other languages like C sharp, sure, why not? Maybe, but it has to make sense into the um, into the context that you're going to use, and I'm not sure if it's going to make much sense maybe it's going to make more sense to, to have it configured in the plugin uh, and in the engine. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, wh when you presented uh, uh, the infrastructure uh, in Pelomi, 
mm -hmm. within Python, uh, you have this like you like we say uh, procedural approach. As I understand. Uh, sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. Sorry. You 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 said that that you have to describe every resource and extra resources uh, in Gloomy, mm -hmm. and comparing to Terraform, you know, you have this declarative approach where mm -hmm. you can only mention about some most important uh, things and the rest is done in the background. Mm -hmm. what, what about in the Pulumi? You have to- Of course you have- uh, Describe everything? Uh, not everything, but there are some necessities that are uh, necessary to be described in order to, to, to do the point. And this is something that you see uh, inside the, um, sorry, I clicked on the magnifying glass. Uh, you're going to see in the uh, different um, providers and the different packages for, for, for each provider because there, there are some dependencies that require some resource to be created and it's not going to be created by default or something like that. And some configuration options are of course mandatory. And you can see those in actually in, in, in your uh, code when you, when you start writing and let's say, uh, here so sorry i cannot uh, yeah okay so um you can see what's the expected list of arguments some of them can be ignored some of them are mandatory depends on what exactly the resources but it's it's not going to take most of the work for you if if there are dependencies that are mandatory or requirements that are mandatory so you don't have to describe every detail, for example, when you... No, not you don't have to describe every detail, but there sure are some mandatory uh, parameters. Like, for example, for one, the name is always mandatory. And so usually... uh, let, let me give you an example. I mm -hmm. have, uh, I want to create VM via Pulumi, mm -hmm. and the VPC already exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How Pulumi is uh, taking care of that? So if the VPC exists, uh, you can, if it's part of the stack, you can use the output uh, from one of the uh, objects that is representing your VPC. If it's not part of the stack, if it's an external resource, you can get a selector of which is going to call uh, AWS, get the, get the information and it's going to create the output for, for the, for the uh, EC2 instance. But it's not going to just guess uh, whatever the VPS, uh, VPC is your uh, machine is going to work, even if it's a default one or something like that. And Apple is also aware of the dependencies. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, dependencies. In order to create VM, you have to have uh, some kind of VPC. Yeah, 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 exactly. Dependencies, it, it's actually working in very similar way to, to Terraform and everything else. I mean, Terraform is declarative. But at the, end, at the end of the day, uh, Pumi, uh, uh, Pogin is also um, doing the same thing as Terraform. It's going to create a dependency graph and it's going to resolve the dependency graph within the engine. And once it's done, then it's going to start working on the different uh, crude operations. And, and, and before, that's happened without your extra effort, right? Yeah, it's you're, you don't have control over that. So sometimes it's okay. actually a bad thing because it's not doing something properly. For example, while, while I was doing this, I created a, an option for the API, which is uh, to throttle my requests and the, the AWS plugin could not create it because it was trying to create it before the API was actually populated with the export. So it, it created some kind of a, a not, not proper dependency graph. And I had to do some other stuff to, to make it work. Like for example, uh, make sure to create the, the, the API first and then work on, on the, uh, on, the, on this particular property that is going to set in the API gateway. And this is a problem of plugin, not, uh, not of Pumi. So essentially the plugin doesn't work correctly in this case, but I'm using a very, um, a very niche case where I'm exporting and importing the, the API with, with uh, API definition uh, and not creating it as, as resources, which is the proper way, let's say, because this one is like static and it's, not very uh it's not good for 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 differentiating between states because it's going to create um different different objects so 
So yeah, it's going to build a dependency graph, it's going to create dependencies, it's going to work on the dependencies. And finally, when it's done, it's going to run on uh, the Pumi uh, provider with those crude operations. Okay, um, I think we are 